Well, welcome to the afternoon session. As Ellen mentioned, we've got a three-part menu development panel process going on, and I'm excited to be the moderator of the middle panel. My name is Susan Renke, and I have my own consulting business, Food Marketing Resources, and I specialize in helping agriculture clients get their products into the food service industry. So what I'd like to do to start is have each panelist introduce themselves. If you could just say um, your name and your company and a little bit about your company. What makes your brand unique among your competitors and in the market? And then maybe a brief line on how you got started in uh, the food service industry and what you do. Because I'd like this audience to know you a little bit and then know the company a little bit. Because so, we have such a diverse panel, you'll see of backgrounds in companies, and that'll help us with the questions process. So David, do you want to start? Because you're right here. Sure. Uh, my name is David Garrison. I'm the director of the Astoria, New York, uh, a uh, very unique hotel in New York City, um, 1,400 rooms. We do about uh, 600,000 meals a year, um, a little less than 100 million in food and beverage revenue, um, four restaurants, 24-hour room, room service, and uh, um, it's, a, it's a, uh, a challenging property because it's uh, 85 years old and uh, we do a tremendous amount of volume, particularly in our banquet operation. Um, what was the other question? How, uh, how you got started sure. and, and okay. how you, yeah. Um, so I, I started in a kitchen when I was 14 looking for a job and uh, in, a, in a little uh, um, fast food, but not the kind of chain fast food. Everything was made from scratch and uh, fell into a job I loved and went to Culinary Institute of Canada uh, and then worked in dozens of places until I landed with uh, the Fairmont Hotel organization. I worked for them for uh, almost 20 years before uh, uh, across Canada and in Bermuda and um, before I came to New York uh, four years ago. Great. Thanks. Thank Anne? Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Anne Riedheimer. I'm the Senior Director of Fresh Food Innovation at 7-Eleven. Essentially, that's R&D. Um, at 7-Eleven, we call it Fresh Food Innovation. Make it fun. Uh, 7-Eleven has about a little bit over 8,000 units across the U.S. and globally about 40,000 units. Um, Japan, we're owned by a Japanese company. Um, many people don't know that. We actually have 15,000 units in Japan alone. Um, it's, it's a little bit crazy over there. And Japan has really helped push um, 7-Eleven and our strategy here in the U.S. and how we're expanding the fresh food service um, because of some, a lot of the learnings we have from the commissary system that they have over in Japan. So we're really excited at 7-Eleven to be growing the fresh food assortment that we have um, I, over the past few years since I've been on board as well as uh, into the future. A bit about my background, I went to school at Texas A&M. I'm a proud Aggie. I uh, have an undergrad in nutrition and then a master's in food science. Out of school, I joined a company called Quick to Fix Foods and did three years of R&D work in the meat industry. Moved on from there to work for Yum Restaurants International, where I worked for about a decade on the international brands, uh, Pizza Hut, as well as KFC a little bit at my end of my tenure there. And then uh, decided to make a change and work on the domestic business and moved over to 7-Eleven. So I've been there for about three and a half years now. Thanks. Hello. Um, my name is Lisa McNeese. I'm the token supplier up here today. <laughs> hey. oh. um, I work for a grower shipper out of Bakersfield, California, Grimway Farms. Um, we're one of the world's largest carrot shippers. Um, we also have a company, Cal Organic, which is an entire organic section of side of our business, as well as potatoes. Um, we both sell retail food service. Um, I've been with the company now over 25 years. Uh, it's kind of scary. I was right out of college. Um, my major had no intentions of getting into agriculture. I was a mass communications ma uh, major. and. I actually worked in the summertime dispatching trucks for a melon shipper out of El Centro, Hopeville, California. And once you get in this business, as many of us, I think, find that there's a love and a passion. It's about relationships and the people that are here, and as well as creating a healthy, um, providing a healthy product for our consumers. So um, I'm proud to be part of you know this this um, panel today as well and. Look forward to learning more. Thanks, Miss. Thanks, Robin. Hi, I'm Robin Fisher. I'm with uh, PF Chang's. Uh, we have two brands, Payway and PF Chang's, and then we have a global um, side of our business, which we have about 80 
90 stores across the country, restaurants across the country, or the world. We have about 500 Payway and P.F. Chang's. Um, the largest spend that we have within our, our group is produce, so it's one of the biggest things that we have to worry about within our, in our group. Um, I don't know really how I got into food service, but um, I do love it. It's um, a great, a great uh, group of people, as Lisa mentioned, and um, I've been doing this for 25 years. I started when I was 12. <laughs> I see that. Maybe she did. John. That's great. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Coker. I'm the executive vice president of AVI Food Systems and a uh, sub brand uh, called AVI Fresh. Um, I run corporate strategy, marketing, and brand development, both internal and external, uh, for that company. Um, I've been with them uh, just over uh, 10 years, and thanks to a few people in this room, um, kind of helped refocus my career and what I do today, uh, taking what was a 50-year-old family vending company um, that played in about nine states uh, to a uh, cross-country, uh, 40 states in Canada now, uh, billion-dollar uh, corporation in less than the last 10 years. Um, and um, our AVI Fresh brand, which is focused on culinary, um, fresh production and development, a lot of what we're talking about today um, and at many of our conferences uh, is what propelled the AVI Fresh brand uh, uh, to the forefront of the market. The big difference between us and many of our competitors like Sodexo, Aramark, uh, the Compass Group, is that we're not procurement corporation, we're a uh, food company uh, that's driven by chefs. And, um, uh, that focus is what uh, creates a differentiation for us in the marketplace and um, something that uh, I'm very proud of and uh, that I love doing every day. Um, Amy and Severe <laughs> are laughing a little bit because they know that I push the envelope daily in what people think of as traditional on-site or on-premise uh, food service contracting and uh, the way we approach it. Um, so um, I started um, also in fast food, I guess, when I was about 15. I might have lied to get my first job a little bit <laughs> about my age, um, and I still do today. I started early. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, spent a lot of time in hotels uh, over a decade uh, with Ritz-Carlton and uh, the Marriott Hotel Company, and uh, also for Sodexo. Um, and, uh, then created um, today what is known as AVI Fresh uh, for a family out of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so thank you very much for having me here, and uh, this is exciting. Thanks, John. Thank I also have to say that uh, my first job in food service was also at 15, <laughs> and I really wanted the coveted job as counter girl at a and <laughs> And so in order to get that, I agreed to be the a and root beer bear and wear the bear suit. So that was my first food service job. Do you have a collection of mugs? <laughs> I do have a couple of mugs, actually, do, yeah. still. Okay. Uh, so our panel is officially titled Sorting and Sifting, Getting the All-Important Consumer Buy-In. Sort of the middle, I guess you could say, the mid-process of menu development, which we're looking at all day today. But as we started thinking and talking about it, we realized, okay, consumer buy-in, what does that mean? So buy-in is important, whether it's uh, your customers, whether they be consumers who come into a commercial restaurant, or maybe their kids, K through 12, or colleges. And then there's also the internal buy-in, critically important, that you can't move forward without. So we're going to touch a little bit on that. And because we're a little bit behind, I think we're just going to do a couple of questions for everybody to be sure to give some input. And then we'll open it up to audience questions, too. Um, and so what I'm going to have everyone start, and each person I'd like to hear, um, and then um, talk a little bit about the, your, how you internally do your menu development process or your your creation creation of menu items. And um, Lisa, maybe you can talk a little bit about partnerships, that kind of thing. Um, 
I recently had the opportunity to tour the Chick-fil-A test kitchen. We were hoping that um, the senior <coughs> culinary chef, Brian Cologe, could join us, but he was busy this week. But they open their test kitchen tours to the public. And um, right on the wall, they have their five-step process that they put in big signs. And um, they, they start out, and it says, understand is their first step. Second is imagine, the ideation stage. Third is prototype, where they're really creating some items to take a look at. And then the next is validate, which is what we're going to be talking about a little bit here. And then last is launch. So I thought that was an interesting way to um, title each of the different steps, because everybody's a little bit different. So um, and David, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, being that you're um, you know, one iconic property here in, in New York, um, how often does your menu change and how do you go about um, creating these new menu items? Well, it's, it's, uh, it, it's great for me to be the small guy uh, <laughs> on, the, 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 on the stage here because uh, usually we're, uh, you know, we're talking with uh, chefs that have uh, smaller operations. But uh, I think we're probably, you know, we're sophisticated in a lot of things at the Waldorf Astoria. I don't think we're that as sophisticated as some of these people are probably in their product development. But uh, it's a really fast-paced environment. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's actually, you know, been described as chaos or insanity a lot of the times, the way that... The, the, the hotel um, works and the, and the culinary team is not much different. We have a very small team of uh, management. We have uh, 140 uh, cooks and we have, uh, we have five managers, which is very uh, very small team to manage that. So really what we do is we've kind of pushed it down to uh, uh, the menu development. Um, uh, if, we're, if we're changing the menu, typically we'll change menus four times a year with the season. Um, if we're changing the menu, I might sit with uh, one of my uh, management trainees who's overseeing that area and say, you know, what do you think? What do you, what do you look at the sales, look at what's selling, and, and get their thoughts, maybe, maybe uh, uh, steer them in the right direction, make sure they understand the clientele and our diverse clientele from around the world that are, you know, that are typically a little bit older and not necessarily looking for um, molecular gastronomy and cutting edge uh, things always. Um, so make sure that they understand that, and then off they go. They'll, they'll create um, uh, some new dishes. Uh, we might have a conversation before they do the tasting. They'll do a tasting uh, very quickly on the fly. We'll invite uh, uh, senior leadership, the you know, general manager, food and beverage director, everyone, the restaurant managers, will invite the team, uh, the waiters, and get their feedback. And uh, really, it's a pretty quick process. It's either yes, no, change this, go with it, we need another tasting. Uh, it's done in 30 minutes. We roll it out within a couple of days. If something's not working, we can take it off and, and change it. It's uh, that's kind of how we so how we work. Organic. It sounds like it right. flows, and you make changes as you go because you can play with that one. Yeah. You know, one. You have multiple. Yeah. Menus in the one location. Nowadays, I mean, in the old days, you, you had you know you had to print the menus off site and it was expensive, and you didn't want to change it. Now we can change them the day of. Uh, I think for me, the most important principle that's changed in my career though is that it, it's really. It's not the chef writing a menu and handing, handing someone a recipe and saying, go make this and, and never change it. It's talking to the team that's making it, saying, mm -hmm. oh, here's an idea, what do you think? How do you think this will affect your workload? What, what, uh, what input do you have? And then they have more buy-in to it and they'll, they'll focus more on quality when they're producing it every day. Okay, great, thank you. And, and Anne, being the size of 7-Eleven is, and um, you have franchisees and so many stores, um, how do you go about getting that in the internal by in your internal partners um, on board with new items? So we have a uh, four-stage innovation process at 7-Eleven. It's very similar to the one you outlined from Chick-fil-A. I think we kind of combined the front two that mm -hmm. they had. It's very similar from what we had at Yum. At Yum, it was a six-stage, but essentially it's the same phases. And early on, you know, you want more of your consumer buy-in, the, the people eating the product, sensory testing. You want the people who are actually going to buy the food. Um, to be tasting the food, evaluating the food, making sure that you're optimizing it for that guest experience, because those are the folks who are putting down the money for the product. But getting the internal buy-in is also very important. We have a lot of franchisees. Uh, we have about 8,000 units. A lot of our units are just one, one operator. So that means a lot of franchisees, and we really need their buy-in, because they're the ones who are ordering the items at their store to sell to their guests. So. Um, we have some meetings that we have internally four times a year with um, key franchisees where we make sure that they taste all the new products that are 
coming in so they understand why we're developing the products, who the target consumer is for these products, so they can make sure that they know that these are the guests we're developing for, these guests are in their stores, and these are the reasons why they need to be carrying these products um, that we've been developing. Uh, we also, internal buy-in buy goes all the way up, so we have our senior leadership taste um, our items on a pretty much a weekly basis. We have tastings of um, new items that we're working on. Continuous improvement is a big part of the culture at 7-Eleven. Um, just because we launched an item a few years ago doesn't mean we're just going to let it um, let it go. We're going to keep revisiting it, get um, consumer feedback, get operator feedback um, to make sure that we continue to optimize our product for our guests. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa, as the token supplier, as you call it, can you tell us in, a little bit about your partnership process with, with operators and probably distributors involved too in, in terms yeah. of working with operators on new menu items? I think it's, it, it's a grower shipper um, processor. We're in a really unique position and I think many of us that are in the same way. Um, you know, when I first started with Grandway 25 years ago, we. I was hired to coordinate between this um, sales and production this new item called baby peel carrots. And that was like fascinating to see the growth of that. And I think we're always looking internally at our, at our growth and what's going to be our next big baby carrot, you know, what are we going to be able to sell. And so we do a lot of things in, in, in our company as far as focus groups, um, ideation as far as different cuts and what we're able to supply. And, those of you who know Grimway, I think we cut a carrot, slice, dice it, cut it every which way possible. Mm -hmm. um, after listening to sh the um, chef Jerry today, it's amazing. He's spot on as far as the roasted carrots and different things that are happening now because here we've been looking internally at what we're going to produce, what we're going to package for the, the next baby carrot, and yet it's just a whole carrot. I mean, it's been right in front of our face, and yet we're selling so <laughs> many of them now. Um, but what is definitely key is the relationships and that we've built. Um, Robin and I work very close together with different items, and she can even talk more about that. And it's not a simple process, <laughs> as we know. Carrot coins? Yeah, it's a long, drawn-out process. But at the same time, I have to make sure that I'm working closely with Cisco, Marcon, and others as far as the distributors to make sure that it's all, it's all working together and we're pulling it you know, the push-through is getting taken care of and it's starting at our end and the distributors get it there and then it's getting to the end to, to the payways, the Chick-fil-A's or whoever else it may be. Um, in addition to that, we're in, just not the chains that we're working with, we're working with the man packings of the world, the Fresh Expresses, the Doles. We're looking, we're supplying them with all their carrot needs and different salad blends and different items that will work for their, their customers. So. It's, it's fun, it's exciting, because there's so many things that's, that, you don't, that are right in front of your face, you don't even think it's going to evolve into anything, and then all of a sudden we have this new item. And, um, and again, you want to make sure you have the volume there that's going to make you know, pull it through, that justifies the means, because I always call our, our facility the big Willy Wonka factory. I mean, it's huge, <laughs> it's ginormous, and there's a lot of machine there, but yet we've got to make sure that it's feasible for us to be able to make those special cuts for different consumers and different customers. Yeah, that is exciting. And the, what you mentioned so much of is partnerships that they were talking about on the panel this morning and communication uh, with the distributors and suppliers, farmers, and then back to the operator. It mm -hmm. can't happen successfully. So Robin, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that partnership side, being uh, your produce category manager for those two brands. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how partnerships um, tie into your menu development process. So what we really do is we've, we have a couple of chefs, one for each brand, but what we will do is we'll bring in suppliers, growers, shippers um, to ideate with our chefs to give them ideas of what they need with an Asian flair. Um, and um, so we have them come in and then they show it. And then what <coughs> happens from that point on is that then the, um, the chefs uh, proceed to do their magic and then they show it to a senior lead, somewhat like this, um, to the senior leadership. Then it goes on to a cross-functional team and then we bring back in the suppliers that, because it always has to be tweaked, it can never be. Um, what they showed at first, but so we'll show that, and um, then it just starts to kind of snowball, and then we get out into the field, 
um, with the restaurants and our different, um, we have certain markets where we test, and so those are really big for us, mm -hmm. and we just make sure that we can do, each year we decide we're gonna um, put something on the menu that's not growing. So we, ha so we have to make sure that we are in the right growing season, but we're, that's, we're, that's probably the challenge because they wanna have all these great ideas, and, mm -hmm. and then the volume, to Lisa's point, it's not a big, it's a little sprinkle on the top, so it makes it harder for the grower, the shipper, the distributors that we use. It's quite um, challenging. Yeah, that sounds. And and I was wondering about the challenge of running tests a few months prior to a rollout. You probably may or may not be prepared. You may or may not have supply. Well, I really rely on um, the grower shipper or um, my distributors that we work with um, to make sure that um, we are going to be in supply. Um, it, if we run it at this particular time, will we be in supply? Um, will we make sure that our guests will be satisfied with it? Because the, the ultimate reason that everyone makes money. So yeah, exactly. Those are the most important things. Good point. Thank you. John, I'm excited to hear what you right. are going to tell us, because we <laughs> talked a little bit yesterday right. in preparation for this, um, that your process of rolling out new menu items is maybe a little bit different than some of the chains. Yeah, so very different, about actually, that. because if, we've got a lot of different market segments, first of all. I'm uh, managing on-site uh, dining for uh, public K-12, through private prep and boarding, college, university, corporate dining, manufacturing, vending. Um, so I've got every arena covered, as well as country clubs and nightclubs, uh, stadiums, arenas, and concessions. Um, so to be quite honest, I take a very different approach than chains because um, our menus change every four weeks. Um, and I do that, um, I started this four or five years ago um, to be able to take advantage of produce items and, um, and get those in instead of planning ahead, I can take advantage of whatever's coming in of the bounty. So I literally shut down our corporate R&D test kitchen, pushed all my chefs back out into the field um, so that R&D is happening every day because our menus are changing every four weeks. Um, and the menus are completely different, as you can imagine, in K through 12 than they are to college university. And I'm sad to hear at Johnson & Wales that you self-op, and it sounds <laughs> awful and tiring there. Call me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Your customer <laughs> potential. <laughs> so, um, you know, that allows us to get on trend and push aggressively. Um, you know, because by the time you've spent six months, a year in R&D and getting everything lined up, that trend has come and gone in today's social media driven environment. So um, I encourage um, our chefs and our collaborators to make everything happen on the field. I, um, I mean, Peter, I met with some of uh, the vendors yesterday on kombucha. Um, and um, by this afternoon, I had seven test sites set up and the product is shipping on Monday morning. Um, to both New Jersey, Dallas, Atlanta, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. So that's the speed that I move our organization. Um, that's, I guess, what makes us different. It makes us nimble because, you know, kombucha, kefir, those are um, hot beverages uh, right now. They're going to continue. They're a little fringy right now. They're going to continue to gain momentum when people understand um, the, you know, the health benefits, but when I find stuff like this, I don't want to sit around and talk about it. I want to take action and I want to get it into the consumer's hands right away because with that kind of menu change every, every four weeks with complete overhauls every 90 days, um, that allows you to take a lot of, of risk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So with that kind of process, how are you measuring the um, end user customer satisfaction or interest? Is it sales only or do you actually, do you gather feedback? We do. Um, it, well, certainly uh, people speak with their wallets as we all yes. know, right? Yes, yes. Um, you know, so you can measure success immediately at the end um, just by running a report off your cash register on those particular PLUs of items that you've introduced. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, I also introduced a couple years ago a text polling system, so it's similar to uh, American Idol. So a lot of my accounts have uh, uh, flat screen TVs that are running the specials. So our customers, whether they're um, 15 years old in high school, 
uh, 20 years old in college or 30 years old in a professional work environment are able to text in um, my questions that are on the screen and watch the results roll in in real time. Um, so not only do my operators know exactly what's happening, um, but the customers have a voice in menu-driven decisions on a daily basis, and they feel part of it, again, and that all runs right into my social media campaigns through Twitter and Instagram. So it just, it's an all-encompassing, interactive um, relationship uh, through the operators, uh, my headquarters, and the consumer. Very real time. Yeah. And how do you get uh, your distributors involved in that process, or do you, in terms of the Well, I don't get them, in, I get them involved as, uh, you know, I'm in constant communication with people um, through, uh, you know, arenas like this, uh, conferences, um, opportunities. I ran into one of my vendors who does, I do millions of dollars at Ready Pack. Um, yesterday at the show, I hadn't seen them. Um, they just rolled out a new organic line, and I said, well, we're one of your main customers in the U.S. besides <laughs> Walmart, why don't I see these in my product lines? And said, well, we just didn't get them to you yet. And I said, well, they should have been with us first. Yeah. And um, so they're in, those are being shipped. They'll be there by the time I get there tomorrow. Oh, good. <laughs> Results, I like that. That's the one thing I was going to say. We, we never show up to a show. If our customers <laughs> see product at the show, right. we've dropped the ball. Right. Yeah. Well, the CEO know. was there um, of that company, so he, was, he understands my position at this point. <laughs> and um, that, um, product, that product is already en route to my uh, headquarters. Yeah. Um, that's great. Lisa, you said that um, your company does uh, consumer focus groups. We do. Do you share that information with your customers? We do. Um, and it, it, about two years ago, we introduced a... Um, what we thought was going to be a big item, and the focus groups even sh showed that it was going to be a great item. Mm -hmm. It was what it is. It's a our baby peeled carrots in a microwave microwave bag, and one has a, a cinnamon sugar um, sauce in there. The other one has a garlic, and um, you just microwave, and the, the pouch you know it, it pops open. And nice. and um, we really thought that was going to be a grand slam. No, and even with the focus groups, so yeah. it's really it's really interesting you know, what we perceived, and, and, but it's, it's not a grand slam year round. However, we bring it back every year during the holidays, holidays. and that's when it's... Flavor profile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, yeah. All about, it's, it's just a certain yeah. time of that year. So, um, but we, we tend to, we try to take it out into the marketplace. We even work with certain retailers, too, in doing tastings in the stores, and okay. um, a good one in California is always Save Mart. They always seem to be open to being able to do that. And again, coupons and um, different ways of trying to get our products out there and introduced into the marketplace. Um, we've been fairly successful with most of them. But there, again, you know, there's always who said something earlier about us a uh, convention where we should all get together that, our failures. Oh, or I love that. that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a great that. idea. Yes. I, I you know, we could all down. learn. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Anne, I have a question for you. Your customers, I'm assuming, have a very limited interaction time with the, with your franchisees or the the store mm -hmm. owners. So um, they're in, they're out, they're buying what they need and driving off. Um, how do you solicit, uh, or do you solicit their um, views or opinions beyond sales? Yeah, it's it's really tough. Most of our transactions are under a minute, so we don't have a lot of uh, quality time, I would say, with our consumers from an operator standpoint. But when we are testing new items, uh, we try to get into the stores. We do consumer intercepts at the stores, depending upon uh, you know what we're testing, how big of an initiative it is. We might do some recruited intercepts where we bring people in and we'll a lot special time with them to get uh, real live feedback on the products or their experience in the store. Um, recently, we've been using our mobile app oh, okay. uh, to leverage some voice of the customer data, and that seems to be a really uh, successful way to get okay. feedback on specific items. And we know we're talking to our customer then because they're people who have opted into our program already, and that's been a great way to gain uh, real consumer feedback on things. Good, good. Well. Being that you just brought up the failure, I'm wondering if you can all volunteer. I won't force anyone, but I'd love it if I could hear um, a failure that you've learned from in your career 
um, and, and you know tie it to menu and uh, if you can but I think um, that would be valuable for all of us um, because I think that's how we learn if we don't to try, we're, we're never going to get better. So, um, David, do you have anything like that you'd want to No, you don't. <laughs> um, no, I, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, uh, yeah, I, won't put you, I, I said I was going to put you on the spot you. and then I did call it. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they want to I don't have a specific one, but I think it's, it's around our conversation earlier on seasonality and just making sure that you're testing products in the season that you plan to launch them or you know don't pull it ahead just because someone wants the sales numbers uh, because they may not actually be the best seasonality for the product uh, so I think we've I've been bitten a few times by people demanding things a little bit earlier and they just weren't ready or the product wasn't ready the produce wasn't ready yeah. um, I have an example now. Demanding people. Oh. <laughs> Actually, it's come to you. Yes. Uh, you know, we have you know we have a massive banquet menu and we have a we have a, um, you know, we do a lot of social catering, very high end, and um, and um, because we have to have a large menu because we have all these people selling it, and they each have their favorites, and they'll show that to the customer, and it could be a banquet for 1,600 people. Uh, we have this, we have this appetizer that's uh, it's uh, layers of, uh, bur uh, it's burrata and uh, red and yellow tomatoes, and. Uh, Baldor hates us because <laughs> we need uh, yellow tomatoes that are not only perfect uh, in, in flavor and color, uh, but the size, yeah. and it's a nightmare. And uh, um, even when we take, we've taken it off the menu, the customers still want it back. So it's, it's, it's a success, but it's a failure in terms of us being able to deliver it. And, and uh, you know, we're flying in tomatoes from all over the world sometimes to get, to get them uh, uh, in the right season. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I was going to say, I guess my biggest, um, right now I'm actually working with a, a chain account and they're looking at roasting um, carrots and um, our, bunch, our bunch carrots, we, they want a baby carrot, a real baby, um, so I suggest why they look at our bunch carrots, because our bunch carrot is a small, we have a small medium bunch and they have tops on them. Well, food service, and they are iced. Food service, the chains can't take ice into the restaurants. That's a big no-no. So we decided to put a little extra labor into it and start topping the carrot, cutting the carrot tops for them. Well, that was great, but then they all, <laughs> then they want their carrot no longer to be no more than four, in, four to five inches in length. Oh, and I promise it's not the <laughs> chain. I so I finally, I mean, there's just comes a point where you're like, I can't guarantee that. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. carrots grow. It's and then, a yeah. natural product, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I'm saying, if you can find that, let me know where to find it. You know, but, yeah. so it's been a struggle. But again, it's mm -hmm. it's fun along the way and experimenting and looking at different ways we can offer our products to an, the end user. Yeah. Well, I have one and I, I think that's time. my part. No, it wasn't really. It was just that I wasn't strong enough when I knew something wasn't going to be in the season and um, I put through my friends at Fresh Point a, um, about nine, was well, four or five months of uh, hell because we decided that we were going to have white grapefruits as a offering in the bar and there is no grapefruits between the time that we were offering it Oops. and so and we couldn't use the fresh we squeezed it was just it was very difficult and I felt that that was one of the times I should have been very strong knowing from everyone telling me they're not going to be there and I, I wasn't I wasn't adamant enough and I think that I grew from that well, you can imagine that I have failures every single day. Um, when you move as fast as we do and push the envelope as far as we do on a daily basis in so many business segments, there's going to be failures. And I'm not afraid to admit that. Um, I think that's what makes us great. I let our chefs drive that. What makes it all work is our relationships with our customers and our vendors. Um, our relationships are what make all of it hold together because we're in on-premise so you know our students are there for a minimum of four years usually or a two-year cycle or in K through 12 um, moving through our system right. so they know our chef and our chefs have relationships with the students um, and our corporations the same thing uh, you know BMW headquarters um, you know they know Joe and they know that oh he screwed that soup up today because he tried to get too creative because I wanted him to throw um, you know, bloom chia seed in it. 
um, <laughs> because I was pushing chia that month, right? <laughs> um, so I'm always pushing something crazy, and they all said, well, the, you know, when I pushed out to the field, I just talked about the kombucha vendor um, that I met yesterday, and um, so when I sent it out to the field, no one, none of my operators, none of my chefs even knew what kombucha was yet. And I said, well, I drink it every day. Why don't you look it up and then hit me back? <laughs> um, so, yeah, right? So we have a lot of failures, but what it comes down to, you know, is our relationships um, with our customers and maintaining that trust and confidence level. And I want that because this is real, it's food, it's human, and it's spiritual. And that's what makes all this work. Uh, the carrot's a perfect example. This isn't, you know, uh, a cookie cutter approach. This is a personal approach, and food should be personal. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Well, to keep us on time track, I think what we'll do, we have another 15 minutes. If we stay on schedule, I'd love to open it up to the audience and let you all ask questions of our panelists here. So, who would like to go first? How you choose which stores or restaurants or units to test in and what factors you think about. Is it how much money they bring in, the demographics, how interested in food they are, um, so how you kind of select where you're going to test your new ideas? So it's an evolving process, I'd say, at 7-Eleven, and it's changed even. I've been with the company for three and a half years, and we've been kind of evolving um, the process as we've learned more about it. Kind of where we are now is we have three established test markets, and the reason why we went about that is that we could have um, specific staff and feedback at the market level in, uh, in those three different areas. So that helps us from a consistency standpoint. We also chose the markets based upon a certain amount of traffic that the stores in those markets get. And they also, they don't all have the same traffic level. So we can understand we have a wide range of traffic levels in our stores, as you can imagine. So some get a lot of throughput, some don't. So we want to make sure that when we're launching a new item, we understand in really high volume stores, what are the, the pitfalls and low volume stores? What are the pitfalls? So we want a little cross section of a little bit of everything. So that's that's kind of the, the strategy. We also have geography. It's it's across the U.S. So we have a East Coast, West Coast, and Central test locations. So we get a fairly good read across the U.S. Um, whether something will be successful, and then we determine if it will be a national play or if we'll just go with a regional launch. Where quite similar with this exception of um, we, we picked um, three markets where we have high and low volume stores within those markets we keep it to between six and seven store restaurants um, we have strong market partners which are like area managers within that area and RVPs which are very strong so we make sure that they understand the difference and our market chefs are very um, strong in these exact markets so that's really what we what, and they're in two different parts of the country so we make sure that we have a broad um, base of our guests that come in hi for David and I guess I'd like to hear from the rest of the group um, we talked a lot this morning about the golden age of produce and how the produce become the, the center of the plate um, how do you think that message would play in your organization, and where do you think that could be? Or what hurdles would there be to be that could that for that to be in the next five years in your organization? Hmm. Um, well, I think for us in particular, the uh, in our banquet operation, you know, which is which is our bread and butter, really. Um, you know, we're. Uh, the, the property is going to, going through a major renovation in the next few years, and we're going to, you know, completely uh, redo the kitchen, look at our technology, and uh, you know, with produce in particular, we're looking right now actually at our, our banquet menu and trying to do more interesting things with the vegetables. You know, the vegetables are often an afterthought in a banquet. You know, it's you know, add some color to the plate, some carrots, some, uh, but really uh, make do some interesting things. I'm 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 sold on Brussels sprouts after the student presentation earlier. Uh, <laughs> with the passion for Brussels sprouts, but uh, I, think, uh, I think using technology, like carrots, for example, uh, cooked sous vide are amazing. And uh, you know, if we have combi therm ovens, and, uh, you, we can do great things with them. And uh, um, 
you know, uh, the customers are really interested in that now. They know a lot more about, uh, you know, they're seeing, uh, you know, I'm thinking about carrots because of, because of you, but they're seeing, you know, black and red and, and yellow carrots in the, in the grocery store and they want to see things like that on their, on their plates. So uh, I, I think a golden age of produce is a, is, a, is a good way to put it. I mean, carrots are round. They could roll on a roller grill. <laughs> they good. I bet they could, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, because America has a global influence um, regarding market sectors, do you do any research on overseas trends? And if so, how do you form relationships that way and how do they impact onto um, menu development? This is to um, anyone. <laughs> Well, we stay in contact. We have such a large global presence. Um, we have an international group that's actually based out of Dallas, and that group does a really good job of sharing, I'll call it learning boards, when they do the market visits. So, you know, if they go to Japan or, or the Philippines or Europe, you know, wherever they may be traveling, um, they come back to us and share the trends that are going on. Um, in the global marketplace. I think just with uh, menu trends in general, you always keep an eye on, on different, uh, different countries, different cuisines. I think World of Flavors at the CIA does a really good job of highlighting different international cultures and just being part of that, um, keeping up with those trends is important and how they filter into the menus here in the U.S. As a, as a hotel, we're, we're uh we're kind of we're reacting. Hilton is a company, but but uh, our hotel in particular is reacting to a change in uh, global travel, and we're seeing uh, influx of uh, uh, Chinese travelers, mainland Chinese, uh, into luxury hotels in the U.S. And we just uh, three weeks ago opened a, a, a eight million dollar Chinese restaurant, um, and with chefs from China and authentic Chinese food, and it's uh, it's it's been very well received so far. And, and in the entire hotel room service, uh, you can you can get you know Chinese breakfast and congee and uh, um, uh, uh, you know Chinese items you know 24 hours a day. In reaction to that market, that's I think it just surpassed 100 million outbound travelers per year out of China. So uh, um, that's that's coming to the U.S. Uh, everywhere uh, soon. Um, I just wanted to mention to Lisa that I remember the. Uh, the carrots with the brown mm -hmm. sugar. I thought it was going to be a great item too. I remember that. And also to let you know, I can let, um, I can get you a Grand Slam 24 three, 7 365. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question back back there. Rich, did you have a question? She's going to bring your mic. Just a quick question. I think it was maybe kind of asked, but um, I have a lot of suppliers growers and so forth that come to me and want to introduce new items. And I always tell them, hey, if you can get it in a, 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 a if you can get our customers to buy into a chain restaurant or something, it would help because then we get them in. So, you know, what what's your advice for someone that's trying to develop a new item? Uh, how, how would you like to see them reach you? Um, you have distributors or direct? I mean, what advice do you give someone that's trying to get a new product in the market and would like one of you to to use it. What do you mean a new product? A new vegetable? A new, a, a new a, like um, a, a new vegetable mix, a, a new hybrid product that's come up uh, or, or, put, or planting more, you know, uh, of a certain type of product, whether it be a colored cauliflower or a Brussels sprout mix or a, a new health blend of some type or a colored carrot or whatever it is that they're starting to grow and they want to grow more and they're looking for more demand, uh, how, how do you have any advice for them of how to go to you to get that going specifically if you're one of the larger, well, just about everybody up there really? Right. You do a jumbo kohlrabi, right? It's great yielding, it's huge. Where do we take it to get the critical mass to get them to get it into the distribution panel? Someone's got a menu with it at some stage. Right. How do we get that item? Because it's a non trend item. But it's difficult for chefs to work with because it's so small and the yield so little. We've got the solution. How do you get it together? Well, I. That, and that kind of stuff, that's all of us that you would call. Um, you just need to call us and we'll work with you. Because number one, it's a new item, like I just gave the kombucha example. If I want to use a kohlrabi, things that start with K, um, you know, then 
you know, we need to educate our team first, our culinary team and everything, on the use and application of that and evaluate a bit. I mean, we work with Produce Alliance nationwide, so they handle all of our produce network uh, for my company uh, in every area of the United States. Um, so, you know, a simple phone call to any of, uh, any of us, I'm sure, can look at that and tell you if there is application. Um, now, I don't know about Grimway, um, you know, but for the rest of us, um, we can figure out, you know, whether that's going to be something that 7-Eleven wants to menu or whether the, the Fairmont can put it in or something that fits into, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Walter. <laughs> I think that that comes into where we um, have our suppliers and if it's proteins or if it's produce or if it's desserts, we have the ideations that come in and a lot of times we will send out to our suppliers uh, a brief of what we would like to see and then that way they can bring in, they can look at it and obviously it's always an Asian flair but I mean I guess we're going to be putting on um, cabbage and what is it? For Thanksgiving, I mean for St. Patrick's Day, what is that? It's cabbage and, and um, cabbage yeah. So that's going to go in an egg roll. No, no, it has a, it has um, corned beef, corned corn beef, beef corn because beef. that says if that doesn't say Asian, Asian I'm Asian not really sure beef. what it is. Yeah, but, um, that's great, that's great. It's Irish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be a big seller. Okay. Um, but no, I think that that's what we really do is when we send out briefs to our suppliers. I don't know how right. if it's a it's a new grower shipper that we don't use it, that's where it gets a little difficult. Right. Then you start with the, whoever your distributor is already working with. But if it's, do your s suppliers, say the grower shipper, do they come in and meet with your culinary team and do ideations and we set up, um, Yeah, we set up those um, probably three or four times a year. Not the exact same supplier, uh -huh. but we have, um, and then they come in and they do their, um, Dog and pony, Dog and shows, pony show. so, to, so to speak, and they and then we have a cross-functional group from senior leadership down to um, myself. Okay, <laughs> got it. I, think Thank I you. was going to mention too. I you know I I created a program called Produce 365, which features different fruits and vegetables every month for every one of the divisions. So it's specific to K through 12, college, university, corporate dining. That's I'm introducing a new fruit and vegetable and ten different recipes around it um, every month, and I'm in my third year of that program. So if there's something new that you want to get movement, you know I can introduce that type of product um, like kohlrabi and its many uses and uh, the nutritional value associated with it. Um, you know, and that's something that's another way because I have a full educational program that's um, very mature now in its third year cross-divisional, yeah, okay. Yes, Gene. I'd like to answer that also. One of the things that's, that's kind of a pet peeve, what he said is right, just contact us purchasing product development, but one of the things our pet peeves is look at some of the policy and tell us, hey, we've got this great item that's all great, but prime rib on your menu. Well, we don't have prime rib on our menu. <laughs> so my thing is do your homework. Go to into a Denny's or whatever the customer is you're calling on, Go into their restaurant, look at their menu, eat there, see what it's like, see what they have, and, and do a little bit of homework before you approach us. Because a lot of times we get people calling about stuff that are just way out in left field. And that's why sometimes they get hesitant to want to talk to people about new items, because a lot of times people don't do their homework. And we all know time is valuable. Another one, you are getting your exercise today, young lady. <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> in those shoes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelly Jacob. I'm with ProAct, and um, this is a, a question for Ann. Ann, by the way, I'm a, I'm a fellow Aggie, so I've got to oh, give you a call after that. that. <laughs> um, being 7-Eleven uh, being a leader in the convenience store channel in developing um, fresh products and a fresh product uh, program, how have you coordinated your, all of your CDCs across the country to have a level of consistency in where you supply product? Um, do you go directly to growers, or do you get that collaboration through the variety of uh, suppliers that you have in each market? Well, we use a lot of, for um, our fresh delivery, we have a CDC system. So we have a kind of a commissary system, I'll call it our kitchens, um, on a national level. I think it's 13 or 14 of them now. Um, and they 
we source most of our product through Cisco. Some other distributors source, uh, go through our commissaries, and then the commissaries <coughs> ship it over to the CDCs for distribution. So there's always challenges when it comes to the distribution of things. But I think we do a fairly good job on sending out national specs on items to make sure that our products are consistent um, across our commissaries. Uh, we try to specify items for 7-Eleven where our team is kind of moving things down the road from a, a fresh standpoint and a differentiated standpoint. It's not just buying off the shelf items, but developing our own bespoke items um, that we have and then it goes through this distribution system. But um, we, we have a lot of opportunity with the CDCs um, and getting it product from the commissaries to the CDC and then delivered fresh to our store every single day because that's um, one of the things that we pride ourselves in in 7-Eleven is that these items are delivered fresh to each of our locations every single day. Um, so you can imagine when there's a snowstorm on the East Coast um, that causes some big issues. Um, you, there's a wide variety of food service operators up there. Um, can you guys each kind of just hit, are you guys looking more at fresh now moving forward or, or value added? Uh, is there a reason why you would pick one over the other? Sure. <laughs> okay. I don't know. We, um, I don't really use a lot of value added. I don't allow that, though a lot of other food service uh, companies do that are like us, the Airmarks, the Dexos, et cetera. Um, you know, our model, we make all of our own soups and stocks from scratch. So if you value added everything, there's no scrap left, right, first of all. And second of all, with most value added, um, you know, it's been processed and gassed and, um, you know, nitrogen flushed or whatever. Um, so you lose some of the flavor intensity and uh, aroma of the vegetable or fruits that I want to maintain. So I want it still as close to intact and as fresh as possible in our unit. So that's always my first choice. Yeah. Could you do break that rule and offer canned beans? Yeah. Canned beans? You yeah. Can yeah, canned beans. Yeah, we use. But I mean, yeah, he's not talking about beans, really, is he? Yeah. <laughs> 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 when, yeah. This question is primarily in for. A pinch. Um, Sorry. Question over here. Jessica. The question is primarily for Lisa. Um, as a culinary educator, I focus a lot of a lot of time teaching our students uh, total product utilization. Um, we were just talking yesterday about the use of carrot greens, um, to, to, which is perfect. So you know, root to stock is a huge thing going on, at least from the chef community standpoint. Um, how is Grimway? You know, just I'm, I'm pinpointing you, are you. Do you sell the carrot greens? Is it something that you've thought of? Um, I love them. <laughs> it actually is something that we've thought of. Um, we have mechanical harvesters that are going out into the fields, and it, it's actually, if you ever have an opportunity in your Bakersfield, California, it's a great, um, a great t time to go out there on one of those harvesters, because harvesters um, run side by side with the trailers, but as a, we're cutting off the tops. We're actually cutting off the tops in the, the fields, and they're going back into the ground, and they're actually being mulched back into the ground, so it adds nutrients back into the soil. Um, carrots, carrots also only grown, we rotate the ground because if we don't, then we start to see nematode and other disease issues. But the tops is something we have discussed and if there's some way to utilize that product. Um, but again, we'd have to go back out there and recapture that because it does go back into the soil. So um, most of our product is interesting within even our baby carrots because we don't have a, what's called a true baby. It's a long carrot cut into two inch segments. Tumbled and polished. Yes, tumbled and polished, peeled and polished. Right. And um, out of that product, though, when the carrot comes in, it's a whole carrot. We probably, within our facility, because we do juice, we have frozen food, di frozen division as well, we utilize probably about 98% of that carrot. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I had a question for Ann. For the students, was it a hard transition to go from a food service, you know, full yum to 7-Eleven? Was that a hard sell, or did that was that a natural progression? It was for me. It was a, a good natural progression because I started my career at, at the manufacturing side and you know a, a production plant R&D environment and a production plant. Then moved to food service, and then 7-Eleven is more like a retail outlet. 
but it's a nice blend at 7-Eleven because what our what we did when we joined 7-Eleven, I say we because we kind of the team kind of all came in around the same time, um, about three to four years ago. We established a food service team at 7-Eleven, so we suppliers would call on us and they keep talking to us like we were a retail team, but we wanted to be treated like a food service team because that's the culture that we're bringing into 7-Eleven is that we, we don't want to be just a retailer. It is a food service environment that we are establishing and we are, we are making that change um, at 7-Eleven. So I have, an, I have a question for you, Ann. Are, are you trying to get more produce into into the stores? Oh, absolutely. And uh, we've been doing a really good job of it over the past couple of years. Last year, um, I'm a packaging engineer on my team, and one of her key projects last year was changing our salad packaging. And that packaging change alone almost doubled our salad sales, just in the aesthetics of the package, the functionality of the package um, on the shelves. The, uh, the operators were more excited about stocking the item because it was more appealing. The guests were responding well to it. So that helped increase our produce sales there. Um, this year, we're doing the same thing with our fruit cup. You know, We're improving the, the functionality of the fruit cup from a consumer perspective, the visual appeal of it, et cetera. And that's all going to increasing our our produce sales as well. So it's a big initiative. It's it's coming from our team. It's coming from the trends. Um, it's coming top down that our guests are looking for better for you items, um, and we need to deliver that. And we're excited about developing them. So. That's exciting. Okay. More questions? I guess we'll conclude then. Thank you, Pam. Thank you.